This is the Graceful Atheist Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Graceful Atheist Podcast. My name is David, and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. Well, I want to thank my new supporter, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel, so much for financially supporting the podcast, as well as Libby, Michael, Ian, James, John, Joel, and James. Thank you all so much for supporting the podcast. And thank you for those who have rated and reviewed the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser.com. I'll note here that I don't get any kickbacks from Podchaser.com. They are currently doing a donations rally for Meals on Wheels, so that if you do a review of a podcast, they send 25 cents to Meals on Wheels, and if I respond to it, they double that. So, hey, win, win, win. If you're interested... Please rate and review the podcast on podchaser.com. Several months ago, back in February, I had a guest, Troy Moore Hart, on, and he was discussing a project that he was in the beginnings of working on that is now coming to fruition. It is called Religion Shouldn't Hurt. And in fact, the weekend you are hearing this for the first time of April 3rd and 4th, there should be a social media blitz with people telling their stories about how religion shouldn't hurt. You can find them on Instagram at religion.shouldn't.hurt, no apostrophe, and on Twitter at r underscore shouldn't underscore hurt, again, no apostrophe, and on Facebook at religions shouldn't hurt. Of course, I will have links in the show notes. More advertising that isn't advertising, I am going to just mention here that the Conference on Religious Trauma, headed up by Janice Selby, is coming up soon in May. It's going to be an online conference from May 11th to the 16th. The conference draws professionals as well as people who have experienced religious trauma, and so it is well worth checking out. I will have links in the show notes for that as well. And then a bit of advertising about myself. I'm not sure that I've ever made it entirely explicit, but I am interested in being a guest on your show if you have a podcast or a YouTube channel. My expertise is, of course, with deconversion and secular grace and humanism. If that is interesting to you, reach out to me at gracefulatheist at gmail.com. Special thanks to Mike T. for editing today's podcast. Mike was last week's guest and the ongoing editor for Graceful Atheist Podcast. On to today's show. My guest today is Rachel Parsons Svensson. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She has her practice at rcpstherapy.com. And it is always interesting to talk to someone who has gone through the deconversion process who also has training in psychology as they are evaluating themselves in some ways. And often I find that psychologists have a self-awareness about them that is interesting to investigate further. Rachel tells her story of growing up and becoming a Christian at three years old, experiencing purity culture as a teenager. She went to Biola University and studied philosophy, where she had learned some critical thinking that made a difference later in her life. She did experience various difficulties throughout her life, but at some point she found that she would break down crying just stepping inside of a church, what she later understood to be religious trauma syndrome. We get into the difficulty of painful life experiences on this side of deconversion without the false sense of support from a deity. Rachel does such an amazing job of sharing really deeply intimate and powerful parts of her story. Without any further ado, here is my conversation with Rachel Parsons Svensson. Rachel, welcome to the Graceful Atheist Podcast. Thank you so much. Rachel, I thank you for reaching out to me. Again, as I've said before, one of the great things about doing the podcast is is people will write to me and tell me their stories. Mm-hmm. And you've shared, you know, a little bit of that. And now we're mm-hmm. going to get into the to the details. Tell me about, first of all, how, you know, how did you grow up? What place did religion uh, have in your life? I would say it was the center so of so much of my life growing up. My parents are still both Christians. 
And um, I was raised Christian, going to church multiple times a week, going to, um, I don't know if you're familiar. I'm sure some of your listeners will be familiar with Awana. I went to Awana and um, going to Bible study and going to church and then on the weekends doing service projects at church or whatever. So it was so much of my life, especially I think because I was homeschooled K through I never went to any sort of typical school. So my social life and my spiritual life was the church. That was everything for me. And I, um, I became a Christian when I was three. I <laughs> prayed the okay. sinner's prayer on my parents' bed. Uh, I led my sister um, in her prayer. Convic- I guess I was very convicting. You know, I was like, you need to become a Christian, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was so mu- it's so much a part of who I was and who I still am in one sense, because it's like, that's my story. You can't get rid of your story. Oh, definitely. It, I'm not, the, would not be the person that I am today without the, the years of, of being a Christian. Right. So uh, it was very much a family thing, very much, uh, you know, your social life as well. Uh, did that continue on through your teenage years, high school, that kind yeah. of thing? So um, oh, I should also mention, I, I think the church for my husband, because that's where I met my husband. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> So when I was in third grade, I think we moved to that church and he is the pastor's son and I thought he was so cute and I like fell in love with him instantaneously. And um, it's one of those like love stories where it's like I knew that I wanted to marry him since I was like a young child and then I got my dream to come true. I'm I'm the luckiest person. (laughs) So yes. So in high school... um, very much a Christian going on missions trips. Um, Christianity and my faith was so grounding for me during some, some hard times. I I had some health issues, depression and anxiety and um, praying to God was so important for me. It was, it was such a huge help knowing that I wasn't alone, you know? Right. And I remember thinking about 9-11, like, gosh, what a shock that was, you know, in my early adolescence. And the comfort then, too, was like, I remember vividly immediately going to my bedroom and praying and Mm. being to God and feeling so much comfort and peace come from that. Um, Just at different points in my life when hard hard things have happened, when grandparents have died, when there's been loss and grief. It's like, that was my anchor. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're skipping ahead just a little bit, but I, I think <laughs> one of the greatest losses of yes. deconstruction, deconversion is that on the other side, when life happens, you can no longer fool yourself. The placebo effect no longer works. It's not there anymore. Um, to skip ahead, since we're already there, I just recently um, experienced a very early miscarriage, which was- Oh, I'm so sorry. For me, and- it was the first time I personally had experienced some sort of loss. Um, yeah, loss since deconverting. And I was like, oh. I was just telling my friend the other day, she's um, secular Jewish. I was like, I used to pray when things like this would happen. And that was really comforting. And now I don't have that. And that, that's, that's, it's like, its own new loss. Like each time you get confronted with something where you would have turned to God or your faith, it's like the loss comes up again and you have to process it every single time. You know, it's not like a one time I'm deconverted and I'm done. It's like, I have to process that loss every single time something new comes up. Yeah. I don't know how much you've listened to the show, but uh, I lost my mom about Mm -hmm. eight months after deconversion. and, And that was... That was really hard because there were just no, again, no fooling myself, no comforting words. And in fact, the, you know, the rest of my family were all, are all Christians. So all of their attempts at comforting words were just bitter, bitter, yes. bitter. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm so sorry for your loss. And, mm, thank you. Yeah. And going through that without faith to comfort you, it's, it's a whole different experience, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Let's circle back then. So 
in your adolescence, prayer is deeply meaningful. It gives you a sense of someone who cares for you. It gives you a sense of a bit of control over the chaos of the world. And and how about later on into the into your yeah? So I went to I went to a Christian college. I'm sure you're familiar with Biola. I went to Biola. Yeah, yeah. I had actually a couple of friends at Biola. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. And I, I don't want to paint myself as like the perfect Christian, though. I, I realize as I'm saying, like, I was so devout and all these things. I was perfect in scare quotes, right? But I was still sneaking out. I was, still, <laughs> you know, I was still um, doing things that I wasn't allowed to do. But I felt such huge amounts of cognitive dissonance and uh, shame and guilt around those things. And so that would then drive me back. It was like this loop that drive me back to being even more devout and praying even harder because, you know, I wanted to be a good person. And I thought this is the framework that I have for being a good person, but it always it was always a little bit hard because I'm not perfect. Right? <laughs> and some of the beliefs were starting to get rub me the wrong way. I think starting in high school about women, mm. um, I, I grew up in a very strict um, reformed Calvinist Presbyterian. Church. Oh, wow. Okay. And, you know, there it's like women aren't even allowed to make an announcement in the pulpit. It's like, uh. that's too, that's too much. You know, that's yes. <laughs> So if there were women missionaries that would come, it was a big deal, you know, whether or not they were going to be allowed to give their talk during the service at the pulpit or if they had to stand down below. Oh, wow. Okay. You know? So it was like, it just didn't jive with me, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, men being the head of the household and all this stuff. And then also for queer folks, it just, I don't know. I was like, this doesn't feel right. Yeah. You know, my in high school when I was 16, I started working at a cafe and everybody there was gay. You know, it's like yeah. my coworkers were gay. And I was like, I don't really feel like they're going to hell. This doesn't feel yeah. right to me, you know? Yeah. Um, so there was there was some questioning. I think the questioning really started then hmm. in high school, probably for me. Several things that I'd like to res- respond to there. One, you know, I think when you meet someone who is gay or lesbian or trans, Mm -hmm. it is so much harder to (laughs) hold the view that they are somehow defective or somehow going, going to hell when you actually care about someone uh, and know them personally. And I think half of the problem is that the church, and I mean that in the broad sense, kind of just pretends it doesn't exist. (laughs) Uh, And so they never truly deal with it. And so when when you as a believer, you make friends and here's somebody that you love and care for, and they are a moral, deep, kind person. And uh, it's very hard to hate that person. A hundred percent. And I never did hate them. It's like, sure. And I don't think I was ever taught that you should. It's just, unfortunately, they're going to hell, which if you really believe that, how can anyone sleep at night? I just don't understand. You know, it's like, that's a hard doctrine. Yeah, two things. Uh, I've already mentioned my mom, so I'll bring her up again. Yeah. Uh, when we first started to go to church, she had this dramatic conversion with drugs and alcohol and got clean and sober for a, a period of time. But when we first got to church, she used to hate when people would say, are your parents saved? And what she meant was, if the answer had happened to be no, <laughs> like how flippant the the question is. Yes. And so if you take this seriously... Uh, which it sounds like you definitely did. It's really, really painful. It's there's as as you mentioned, cognitive dissonance. Like, how can I truly believe that this person who I care about is is damned? Right. Yes. And and there was there's always that question. I feel like in every church there's that question. It's like, well, babies do babies mm. who do, you know. It's like, where's the cutoff? You know, do we believe in a God who sends babies and little children to hell? You know, and for me, that was a very personal question because my mom had several miscarriages, one particularly late term. And I thought, well, is my baby brother? No, God, God wouldn't send my baby brother to hell. It doesn't seem right. But then once you start questioning that, like you then start questioning the concept of hell. So even at a very early age, I was like, 
this doesn't seem I, this something about this doesn't seem right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just can't buy it. You know? Yes. So, I think you know you you've said many times, quoting your friend, talking about you know that deconversion happened very sudden suddenly, but it was all it was all along. Like I had been questioning some of these things all along. But I don't think I ever felt like I could question it out loud. It was a very private questioning. There was no talking with anybody else about what I was thinking and feeling. That I don't even think I admitted it to myself for the longest time. Right. So one other thing that you you mentioned was just the acknowledgement or the honesty to recognize that you are not perfect and the incredible damage of the flip side of grace is that, you know, you're a sinner and you're broken and you're, you're unworthy and you're, you're filthy rags. And you know what that does to a person when you are just being human, uh, particularly, oh. I think during the adolescence years, obviously you're, you're discovering sexuality, yes. you know, all of these very normal human things are happening. And and the church overlays this idea of that you're bad for feeling these things. Yes, 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 yes. I want to say yes a thousand times to that. I think especially regarding my sexuality, there was so much shame about wanting to be with my now husband. Right. And that was overt shame. Like my, um, I'm not going to name names because I don't want to sure. you know, dredge up old stuff. But my family would definitely say in public, and privately to me, very shaming, damning things about me being a normal teenager. Wow. Right? And it's like, right. then I felt awful about it. I remember my first therapist even was like, Rachel, you know that's wrong, right? Right. I'm like, you're my therapist. You're not supposed to say stuff like that. <laughs> but, you know, to be fair, she was a therapist at Viola. You know, that's yeah. probably... It probably was her worldview and she was trying to call me back to the fold, you know, in some way. And I think if maybe you could comment that mm -hmm. there's an extra layer of shame and expectation on women. A hundred percent. Don't get me wrong. Men, men and boys <laughs> definitely have a lot of guilt and shame don't, for sure. But, but somehow it becomes the responsibility of young women. Yes. So I will speak to that from several perspectives. One is, yes, I definitely grew up in purity culture. I know everybody's talking about purity culture right now. I remember going to the store, the Christian bookstore and seeing the true love waits rings and doing all this yeah. stuff, you know. I remember my mom, um, I think with every loving intent was really exploring, what's the word, betrothal. Mm. As she thought, maybe this is the best way to help you know, my, my children stay pure. Maybe I can betroth them and they can, oh, wow. they're really into courtship. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there was a pamphlet that I don't know if she meant to leave, but it was on my bathroom counter at one point. <laughs> right. I wish I knew who wrote it, but it was called dating. Is it worth the risk? Oh my God. And it's like, <laughs> okay. So yes, there was a lot of, a lot of pressure about dating, sexuality, purity, and all that stuff. And especially on women in that, you know, I, I was taken to a modesty conference when I was in high school. Wow. You didn't know that there was such a thing as a modesty conference. <laughs> and, you know, there's so much responsibility that I felt as a, like I hit puberty early. So it's like, I, I looked like a woman and I look back at pictures and I was kind of cute too, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, I was responsible for covering my body in a way so nobody would look at me and sin. Mm. And that's something that I don't think, like, I just got a real visceral feeling, even just saying that kind of made me sick to my stomach. Yeah. Thinking that I, as a young child, felt responsible for covering my body so that boys and men, even I was aware that right. it wasn't just pe my peers, it was men. I, as a young child felt responsible for men, not looking at me and sinning. And like, it makes my voice shake even thinking about it. So sad that I had that on my conscience. I am so sorry. I've mentioned I'm a bit older, so I, I didn't <laughs> uh, have uh, quite the same level of purity culture issues, but 
my heart breaks for kind of the millennial age people who in that nineties time frame were growing in, into adolescence. It just feels like it's devastating. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Thank you. So the other thing that I think is really interesting that you mentioned is at a very young age, recognizing that this just doesn't quite work, then not being able to acknowledge that to any other human being. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly isolating. Mm -hmm. And I find it really telling that even a young person, even a child in some cases, mm -hmm. can make a, a moral argument or, you know, against uh, what the church is teaching. So how did you wrestle with that? How did you deal with that isolation? I was very depressed. Mm. I think that's, that was my response to it. And I think I thought, well, at least Jesus understands me. I never felt super connected. This is a, this is a funny thing. Talk about like daddy issues. I love my dad. We have a great relationship now, uh -huh. but we struggled when I was younger. Okay. And I would be like, God, the father doesn't understand that Jesus does. And so it like, what a weird idea. How yeah, yeah. rejected my experience onto God. Everyone does. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what everyone does. That's what God is, yeah. right? Is our projection. Now yeah. I see that. But I was like, God, the father doesn't understand that Jesus does. And so I just took a lot of solace in my relationship with Jesus. I think that's how, how I just made it work in my mind, you know? And then you went to Biola and, and what, what did you study there? And what I studied philosophy. Really? Uh -oh. And I was in their honors program. Cool. And um, their honors program was a great books program, which was just really incredible, where you get to skip all the um, gen ed classes, the humanity gen ed classes, and instead you read great books and you discuss them for three, you have two three hour classes. Um, so you're reading a book a week and discussing it for six hours with your peers. And I love I wish I could go back there in some yeah. ways, but I know that I can't because like you can't return because I I can't return. I'm not a Christian anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I miss that. That was sad. But that was really special. And something that maybe people don't know about if you go to Biola, you automatically get a Bible minor. Right. Okay. So I was philosophy and then a, a Bible minor. Interesting. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, so first just to say that, you know, I actually have very fond memories of Bible college, you know, there were mm -hmm. many, many problems, but the atmosphere of learning, uh, a number of my professors were really, really talented and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. taught real critical thinking. And I often joke that they did their job too well. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, you know, we can acknowledge that, you know, there were good parts of Yes. Of being at a Bible college, but were was there a, da a dark side there? Was there any experiences that yeah. weren't so great? Yeah, there were for sure. I um, I got more um, depressed there. I think because the cognitive distance was building in me, and so my way of dealing with that, the depression, I think, is like a sh of my brain's way of shutting down, mm -hmm. and so that's what my brain did. And also, I'll just say, like, I really believed. And so by really believing, I mean, like, I believed in like demons and everything. Right. Yeah. And at that school, there was a certain subset of students who were really big into like praying against demons and walking the campus and casting demons out of the campus and stuff. And like saying it now sounds interesting. Right. I, I went to a Pentecostal school. So yeah. That so you perfectly normal. Yeah. So you totally got it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I and I believed it already, but then they were focusing on it so much that I was like, oh my God, it's like, there's demons. Mm. And I started getting kind of paranoid and we'd be like praying over my room because then I started having demonic dreams and I would like see things and hear things. I had some auditory hallucinations. It's like, it can, when you really believe it can play some dark tricks on your mind, you know? Yeah. And it's terrifying. It's really terrifying. So yeah, that was one of the darker parts of college for sure. I can imagine. So I became a Christian in the late eighties and that is the Frank Peretti. Yes. Like that's basically when that began. And I remember this was maybe the first part of cognitive dissonance for me was that I had family members who were 
what you're describing, you know, a demon under every doily. And I was yeah. like, listen, that can't be real. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that was the first skepticism that I had was like, right. it's just, you know, anyway, so I find that fascinating. But again, this goes back to how seriously you were taking it. And mm -hmm. I think this is underappreciated by the believers who look at people who have deconstructed and deconverted is how seriously we took it when we believed and that that is one of the reasons we deconverted, <laughs> not, not in spite of that fact. Yes. Yes. I took it very seriously and I read all the books and I went to all the conferences. Like I, in the great books program, um, we read all the church fathers. We read the creeds I've, I've done, I know my church history. I, you know, it's like, I read the Ist institutes. I know, I know all that stuff. Um, and I still deconverted. It's not because I haven't done enough research and haven't listened to enough right. and you know, Right. And the philosophy background as well. So and my philosophy background. Familiar. Yeah, absolutely. I remember we critically read a book that now my husband is reading. My husband is um, very much an autodidact. He's a really smart guy. And so thankfully, we have deconverted together. I'm so, mm. so grateful for that. He's reading the book that I saved from college from my philosophy program called Value and Virtue in a Godless Universe. Mm -hmm. And we read it and I was like, oh, you can have morals even if you're not a Christian, you know? Right. And um, we were supposed to read it critically and like poke holes in it. But I was like, no, this is good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this actually makes sense. I'm like, no, this, is, <laughs> and this makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned your husband. How did you guys, you met because he was the, the pastor's son. and the cute he, pastor's son, yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> when did you get married? And, and let's talk a little bit about how yeah. you had parallel tracks on this. Yes. Um, so a little bit about our history. My parents, so we were going to, my, to his parent, his dad, where his dad was pastoring that church. And um, when I was mid high school, there was sort of like the new, what, what is it called? The new reading of Paul, a uh, federal vision. Have you heard of this? I'm not familiar with it. Anyways, it's very niche. Talk about reformed niche stuff. Got it. Anyways, it was this big thing in the reformed movement of like reinterpreting Paul or something. It's very minute details, but for some reason it was considered a slippery slope to heresy by a lot of the elders in the church. Okay. Uh, right. It's like everything hangs. It's like everything is so big. Right. right. I was just talking to my therapist this morning, actually. And I just started working with her and I was trying to describe the way I was raised. And she's like, it sounds very black and white. I'm like, yes, everything is black and white. Right. Yeah. Even just the term slippery slope. Yeah. One of the things for me was recognizing I'm constantly defending this to myself, even not just, not just to the external world, but to myself, I'm defending this. If it requires this much defense, maybe it's not true. Yeah. Yeah. And that's hard to admit to yourself. Yes. <laughs> yes. So anyways, so my parents were actually part of the slippery slope to heresy. So they had a big falling out. So if you can imagine, like, that was, a, that was really traumatic for me because here my parents and my boyfriend's parents were at war with each other is what it Oh, wow. Like. And it became a very personal attack. So it wasn't just about the beliefs. It got very ugly. And so there was a lot of tension in our dating relationship. There was tension about our wedding and who was going to attend and who was going to perform the service. Wow. Um, like all this stuff. And I'm so grateful that everybody, you know, made a truce for the wedding, but it was a little awkward. <laughs> yeah. I got married when I was 21. After I graduated from Biola, I was like, get me out of here. Like, I just need to get married. I just need to get out of here. It was too tense. I was so depressed at that point. And I was like, I just need to leave. So I did. I got married. I packed up my bags and moved to Ohio with my husband. He was there for his PhD program. We lived there for a couple more years and then moved back to LA. So start leading me towards recognizing for yourself or coming to 
admit to yourself? What were the steps that got you to that point? Yeah. So once I moved to Ohio, I, we were going to church. We were still Christians, but I think that's when the depression started hitting me really, really hard. And I want mm. to say that so much of the depression was linked to religious trauma and just feeling so, what's the word? <laughs> so confused, so let down, so hurt by the church itself, the institution. Mm -hmm. And um, because of the church, ugly church split stuff, and then women and queer people and all this stuff, I felt so let down. And I started having a trauma response every time I stepped into a church building. Oh, wow. Okay. Where I would shut down. I would be weeping. I would have to leave the service every time. Sometimes I would start crying on the way to church in the car. My husband would have to pull over and be like, are you okay? Should we not go today? And I would try to power through, but then I'd, sometimes I was able to just like sit there stone faced, but that's not really great either. And I thought, is there something wrong with me? Like, what is this? What is this? I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I didn't want to stop going because that was, I was out there. I, all I knew was my husband. I was hoping to find a community in this church. Right. So I was so alone, you know? And the thing that you go to for solace is the thing that is hurting you, but you, you can't quite, you can't make that connection yet. Right. So I think in my deconversion story, I think first I started getting disillusioned with the church itself. I saw through the institution of a church and that it wasn't, you know, everybody makes the excuse in the, in the church of, yeah, of course you're going to find hypocrites in the church because it's made up of people and we're imperfect, we're sinners. It's like, yeah, but this is really ugly, guys. Can you take some responsibility for for what you've done, you know? Yeah. So then we moved back. I started going to another church. I thought, okay, maybe it's just that particular church wasn't the right one. Maybe we'll find another one. Right. I was having the same response. I was sitting in the back pew crying my eyes out. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, whoa, okay. Maybe if I go back to my home church where my father-in-law is the pastor, maybe that will be the answer. We start going there. Nope. And I'm like, okay, there's something going on here. So thankfully around that time, I had my oldest son and it was this natural break of, I don't have to go to church because I have a newborn. And, and he was in fact, a very colicky newborn. So even if I wanted to bring him, he would have cried and cried and cried the whole time. So it was, it wasn't going to work. And I did bring him a couple of times, but it just wasn't working. And then I started realizing once I had that space from going weekly, I was like, oh, I can breathe again. Mm. I don't have anxiety every Saturday, knowing that I'm going to have to go to church on Sunday. Wow. This feels so good. And my husband would say the same thing, like, this, this is, feels so much better, you know? Yeah. And so it was like, we broke up with the church first, but we're still very much Christians. I completely understand that, by the way. Yes. I, I had some negative experiences and it still took 20 years <laughs> for me personally of still considering myself a Christian. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So... Then podcasts, interestingly enough, are a very big part of my deconversion story. Okay. Yeah. So I was, uh, I listened to the liturgists podcast and yeah. they had Pete Enns on. Pete Enns was talking about the Bible and different ways that you can read the Bible, ways that were not the way I was raised and the way I was right. taught. Cause I was like, inerrant, you know, infallible word of God, you know, it's self-attesting. Hardcore Calvinism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. 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 Yeah. And I'm like, this is weird. And I told my husband about it a little bit. And because it was so new to me, I did a horrible job explaining what he was saying, but I would, and, and my husband was like, no, nah, I no, Rachel. And so I bought this book. It was like four different ways you can read the Bible with like R.C. Sproul was one of the people and Pete Enns was one of the people. And I can't remember the mm -hmm. ones, but they were giving different ways that you can read the Bible. And I read what he, what Enns wrote. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is radical. Yeah. Started listening to his podcast. And then I had my husband start listening to his podcast. And that's when my husband was like, interesting. <laughs> 
Yes. And I still remember <laughs> driving with him to a family Christmas party. And we were listening, our son, you know, our baby was in the back seat and we're sitting in the front seat, listening to an episode where they talk about, I think it was jo the book of Jonah mm -hmm. and talking about how it was, you know, just obviously a parable. Like that was one of the first things he says, he's like, obviously it was a parable. And I'm like, I'm 31 years old. And I just realized that a person did not actually get swallowed by a whale, live inside his stomach for three weeks, then get thrown up. Like I literally thought that. I thought that was real. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm 31 years old and I just realized that was a parable, you know? And then I realized, and then, and then it just sort of like, it's like floodgates, right? Once, once one thing is not literal, you're like, oh, what else isn't literal? Mm. It's not just about what's literal. It's I've been taught this. And now I've discovered that one element of that may not be correct. Mm -hmm. What else may not be correct? Yes. Is a super dangerous thought to have. <laughs> it is so dangerous. Yes. <laughs> so dangerous. Talk about a slippery slope. Yeah. I think that I think that conservative Christians are so wise to hold so firmly to an infallible and inerrant Bible because it's a slippery slope. Mm. You know, it's like once you start questioning some of those things, it's it's like, yeah, I, you're right. It's dangerous to ask those questions. It's yeah. dangerous to, and I know that there's lots of Christians like Pete Enns, I think he would call himself a Christian, who just interpret things differently and they can remain Christian. And for a hot second, I was doing that. Right. For a hot second, I was like, okay, so it's a parable. Yeah. I still believe in Jesus though. And I, but then, but then it was like, it happened all at once. And I was like, but I don't anymore. Mm, yeah. Can I read you a poem? Absolutely. That'd be lovely. Yeah. Okay. Cause this is the moment that I was writing about. So I just to tell you, I have um, a project with my friend called small words, big stories, and you can find it on Instagram and online. We will have links in the show notes yes. for that. We write poems and invite others to submit their poems. And the whole idea is that just that they're really short and they can be about anything, you know. And so this is a poem I wrote, I think like last week, about my deconversion. And it goes, hello, are you there? I keep praying, pleading, calling out knocking on the door, but the palpable silence makes me think there's no one there. There is no door. With equal parts, grief and relief, I make peace with the silence. And that thought of equal parts, grief and relief, that, that was the realist. That's what it was like for me. Deconvert. It was like, I can let go and I, but I don't want to let go of some of the beauty of it, you know? Right. And the first Christmas after I stopped believing was so hard for me. It was so sad for me because I loved celebrating Christmas. <laughs> little baby Jesus. It's like little baby Jesus. You know, you <laughs> let go of that. Right. You know, the other thing about Christmas for me now is, mm -hmm. so Dan Dennett calls this belief in belief that belief in and of itself is a good unto itself. And Christmas time is where that just is screams out, right? Everything is believe and it's very generic, <laughs> you know, and, and they don't really mean Santa Claus there, right? Like under the hood, they are yeah. implying some more things. Yeah. I, I do enjoy Christmas quite a bit, but like, it, mm -hmm. there's still a part of me that that manipulation is so loud in my ears now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm just aware like Easter's coming up. Easter was my favorite holiday. I would cry tears of joy on Easter Sunday, thinking about Jesus rising victorious from the grave, conquering sin and death. I mean, what a great story. Yeah. That's a great story. It is. <laughs> and I don't believe it anymore. And that's sad. It is a deeply compelling story. And uh, one of the other things I've pointed out is 
and I don't know if this is a Western thought or or where this originates, but the idea of of dying for the people that you love. Yes. And I like to say that it's it's more than just the Christian context. If you think about all of the movies where that occurs, war movies, dog movies, <laughs> you know, I mean, you could just go through all these genres where someone sacrifices themselves for the good of other people. And that is deep, deep in our consciousness, in our psyche, and it just calls to us. And so the resurrection story is the story, the, the Western story that calls to us. And it, it is compelling. Yeah, it's really, really beautiful and ugly in some parts, but it's really, yeah, that part is really beautiful. So even just thinking about raising my kids, you know, I have an almost four-year-old and he asks really good questions mm -hmm. and I'm starting to have to answer some of these questions. Like he's like, what the other day, he's like, what's Easter? And I'm like, oh, shoot, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I usually say things like, well, some people believe and then I'll say, yeah. And then I will usually ask him, what do you think? Do you, and then I, it, just because he understands these words, I, I say, what do you think? And then I'll, I'll maybe ask him, like, do you think that's real or pretend? And like, whatever he says is fine. Sure. I don't really steer him one way or the other, but we're starting to have those conversations and that's weird. Yeah, I bet. I actually would recommend or, or encourage you to continue that. I think there are some people that feel so disillusioned, so angry that they just don't want to talk about it at all. And I think being aware of this group of people believes this thing and this other group of people believe this other thing and they don't quite mix with each other yeah. <laughs> is useful even at a young age, right? It so, so is. And I remember when I was being raised, my parents commenting on, you know, how other parents raised their children not giving them a moral framework, not giving them a belief system, letting them choose for themselves. And they were very critical of that because they thought it's the parent's job to tell a child what the truth is and what to believe. Hmm. And I understand that. I really understand. That. And I understand that they did the best they could, you know, right. and they gave me what they thought was the truth. And that's beautiful. Right. Right. And I think, you know, it's not really trusting of kids. It's like, if it's really true, then my child is going to come to the truth it, when I, you know what I mean? Right. It's like, I'm going to present everything to them. And if it's really true, then they'll believe it. It shouldn't need to be enforced. Yeah, I should. Yeah, I shouldn't need to indoctrinate them. Uh, we can continue on with the parenting, but I do want to get back to yes. uh, you and your husband. Who yes. told the other one first? And what was that conversation like? Oh my like? gosh, it's like coming out. It's seriously yeah. it's like coming out as a queer person. And I say that as uh, I, I'm bi, so like I know what that feels like. To right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, what should I say? It was like you know we were listening to these Pete Enns podcasts, blah blah blah. Fast forward to me being pregnant with my second son, and we had my first son baptized. And so I was very pregnant with my second son, and I said, "Are we going to have him baptized?" And I knew this, I just knew in my bones, this was going to be it. Right. Yeah. It's like, whichever way we go on this, this, this is, this is a big deal. And he kept avoiding having the conversation. He would, it's like, he wouldn't talk to me mm. and he would like leave the room and I'd like follow him. So like, are we going to have him baptized? Are we gonna have him baptized? <laughs> yes. And yeah. he starts getting angry with me. Like, why do we have to have this conversation? You know? Mm -hmm. And I, okay, this is it. So I'm like, sit down at the table, please. We need to have this conversation. And we just got really real and really honest with each other. And I think he was the one who said it first, which was the only reason we, why would we, why we would do it is because it's a nice tradition. We don't believe it anymore. Wow. And then I started crying because I'm like, we don't believe it anymore. What a moment. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. But then again, it's that mixture of grief and relief that I wrote about in that poem. That's the grief. And then I started co contacting all of my friends who I knew were former Christians mm -hmm. or who were questioning. And I'm like, I'm not a Christian anymore. 
I'm like, hey, guess what? Yes, very excited. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And that was well received, I imagine. Yes. Yes, it really was. It, and and they were so supportive of my journey of that mixture of grief and relief of crying over. Gosh, that was a beautiful moment when I had my son baptized by his grandfather. You know, that what a special moment. And we're not going to have that. My second son, you know. Yeah. And he also doesn't get to, to be raised in the church with all the. I believe traumatic doctrines of hell being taught to young children. Like how lucky is he that he doesn't have to lay in bed as a six-year-old thinking about his best friend burning in hell, you know? Right. Did you have any explicit conversations then after making that admission to one another of how would you pass on your values? What were your values? How did you, how did you decide to do that? Yeah, it's been a, it's been an evolving conversation. Um, because our kids are so young and my husband's really good about encouraging me not to tell them what to think. And I don't do that anyways, but he's, he's like even more so than me. Like, I'm like, well, here's what some people believe and here's what other people believe. He's like, let them just figure it out. They don't need to know everything right now, you know, <laughs> let them just figure it out. But also protective. It's like we we don't want to just send them to church with their grandparents right now. Like I, mm. I, I don't trust what they're going to be taught or what they're going yeah. to hear. Because my son's really smart and he listens to everything. And I'm like, I don't know what they're going to say. And that scares me. Right. And at the same time, I'm like, well, I can't protect them forever. And it's funny being on the flip side because one of the reasons why I was homeschooled is because of that very reason. It's like my mom didn't want me to go to school and... She didn't know what they were going to say. And she wanted to protect me and shelter me. And I'm doing the opposite. Right. <laughs> but for opposite reasons, you know. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So at some point, probably they are going to go to church. Right. I don't know what that's going to look like. My, you know, that's, that's their grandfather's job is to pastor a church. And then my parents are very devout and they go out, you know, weekly. So, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think all parents deal with the the grandparents having slightly different traditions or not just traditions, but the way they interact with your children. You can have some tension about that just in a secular sense. And then to add on top of that, this faith layer. And I think the other thing that, that really jumps out at, as you're describing this is, you know, as, as a parent, how, how much your child is feeding back to you. They want to show you that they understand you and that they love you. And so they are easily manipulated. <laughs> Even accidentally, you can manipulate them. Oh, and 100%. Yes. The thought of sending them somewhere where that might be explicit is terrifying. Yes. Yes. Especially because I keep coming back to this because their father is a past, their grandfather is a pastor. It's like, they're going to be sitting there in the pew and it's like, well, that's my grandfather. Of course, I'm going to trust what he's saying. You know? Yeah. And I, I, and I want them to trust what he says, but not in that setting. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Back to, you know, how much you, you tell them. I've explicitly said to my girls that, you know, I want to teach them how to think, not what to think. Yes. And I, of course I tell them my values, but I sometimes wonder if I need to be more explicit about that. I, I don't want, you know, have them to come back to me when they're 30 and say, Dad, why didn't you tell me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so there's definitely a very fine line there that is hard to walk. Yes. About everything in parenting. You know, it's like you don't go too far and, and one way or the other. Parenting's the hardest thing, you know. Yeah. It exposes all of our flaws and, you know, our rough spots and all of our... So yes, I agree. So we haven't mentioned uh, explicitly yet that uh, you are a professional counselor. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know a little bit about what led you to that field. And then I have a few questions about what you've learned that applies to religious trauma and mm -hmm. cognitive dissonance. So I, I shared a little bit of, in my story about, you know, experiencing a lot of depression and anxiety. And so when I went to therapy for the first time, when I was in college, I was like, you know, even though my therapist wasn't perfect and no 
course it is. But I was like, this is what I've been needing. I've been needing a space to say all the things that I've been thinking and feeling that I didn't, that I felt were un, unsayable, you know, really unsayable. Right. And then I had subsequent therapists who were just really wonderful. And I found so much healing in that space, just being unconditionally accepted, which I didn't get from the church, that sense of unconditional acceptance and unconditional love. And I think every human needs that to feel all right in the world. Absolutely agree. I'm sorry to interrupt yes. you here, but this is so critical. Like, yes. So if you've listened to the podcast at all, this idea of secular grace, that's truly it. Uh, now, obviously, I'm very supportive of the professional therapeutic environment, but what I'm trying to capture here is that we can actually be that for one another in a non-therapeutic environment, right? Yes. As a friend, as a loved one, as a as a spouse or a a partner. That the ability to be vulnerable with another human being about our deepest unsayable things and have them not run away screaming is so cathartic. It's so meaning making. It's yes. so wonderful. Yes. And I'm very excited to hear that you encountered that with your, your therapist. Yes. Yeah, I really did. And I, I also encountered it with my husband. I think my husband is one of the biggest parts of my healing. Um, wonderful. And he's an, the best human being I know. He's so incredible. He's a great dad, a great husband. He's amazing. And apparently very cute. <laughs> very cute. Still cute. Yes, yes. 11 years later, still cute. Well, 11 years of marriage later. Anyways, so that was very powerful for me to experience that. So I was like, um, I want to give this to other people professionally for my job. I want it to be my job to love people. Like, that's what I felt like therapy was, was like a big hug. Like, I love you. You're okay. You know? Right. And so I went to school and actually part of my deconversion, I was still Christian when I was in graduate school, part of my deconversion, I think, uh, has to do with just starting to understand, you know, some of the cognitive distortions that we're sp we were supposed to be able to identify in our clients' thought patterns and, and reflect back to them and help them kind of come to a more realistic point of view. And how so much of Christianity felt like a one giant cognitive distortion. <laughs> exactly. Gaslighting, basically. Yeah. And it was like, oh my gosh, this isn't right. This isn't good. You know? And I was like realizing, oh my gosh, all this black and white thinking and all or nothing thinking and minimizing and maximizing and catastrophizing and like all this stuff. I'm like, oh, that's my religion. You know? Wow. And also it's like, how can you sit? I don't know. Maybe some people have managed to do this. But for me, I was like, how can I sit with someone and truly not judgment them in the therapy room, but think they're going to hell in real life? Right. You know? It's it's just right. not going to work for me. So the idea of cognitive dissonance pretty much is just, it's like you hold some implicit or explicit beliefs. You encounter some other way of thinking and doesn't match with what you're already holding. And we as human beings are so, so complex. We're able to hold two opposing things at the same time mm -hmm. inside ourselves. I mean, that's just normal. But when it really comes to like some of your deepest, most profound beliefs, and there's like two opposing ones, right? right. That can create a lot of tension, a lot of anxiety and cognitive dissonance. It's like something doesn't feel right. And we all walk around with that at any given time. But when it's such a core foundational belief, like your belief and your relationship with God, that's really, it's very stressful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is something that I've tried to capture in that it's different to learn about cognitive dissonance. And it is another thing to recognize it in oneself. I, I'm curious if, was there a chicken and egg there? Like, you know, did, did you learn about it first and then recognize it? Or did you start to recognize it already and then identify it as you were learning about it? I think, I mean, I experienced it obviously, but I had no, no name for it. I thought, you know, this is what we do when we're kids is we think our experience is what everybody else is experiencing. We right. assume, oh, this is normal. So I assumed that experiencing cognitive dissonance and 
depression and anxiety and feeling like a bad person and feeling mm. unworthy because I was a sinner, all these things. I thought everybody felt that way. That's just normal. Why talk about that? You know? Right. And then you start realize, and because I was so insulated in my world and exposed to, you know, different kinds of people. And then, and then going to college, I was like, Oh, maybe I should talk to somebody about this. I don't feel like everybody else is walking around feeling this way. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Wow. Interesting. Do you want to talk about your practice now? Like, what is it that you focus on? And- yeah. So I have a little private practice and um, I was trained. I specifically got five years of additional training beyond my master's degree in foster and adoption related trauma and experiences of foster and adoption, adoptive families and kids. Um, so that's one of my specialties, but then just trauma in general. Um, and attachment trauma specifically. I love working with kids. I love working with adults. I love working with couples and families. I mean, I just, I love it all. I think it's, I think it's such a cool, I I think I have the best job in the world. I think it's such a cool job. Did you professionally or in, in, in your education, did you come across the idea of religious trauma? No, which is really interesting. So um, I didn't hear about religious trauma until I think I listened to an episode of The Life After, which is a great podcast. And I yeah, love those guys. Yes, I think it was um, who was it? Marlene Wanell. Leaving the fold. Yeah, she talked about that, and I was like, oh my gosh, that was me, right? Right. And I was like, there is a name for that. That's incredible. Um, because it's, it's similar to PTSD, but it's not, it's, it's its own thing, you know? Right. And since then I have had, you know, several clients, I'm so grateful that I've been able to help them who did experience a lot of religious trauma. And so I've been able to walk through that with them having my own lived experience, knowing so deeply what it feels like. So I can walk alongside them and say, yes, you're normal. And I think that's what I want to say is like, you know, you are so normal for feeling this way. Anybody there listening, it's like, you are so normal for feeling that, that stress, that tension, that anxiety, that depression, all that stuff. It's because it's because something's not right. And your body is trying to tell you the best way it knows how that it's not right. Yeah, I just want to highlight three things that I think are kind of unique to the deconstruction, deconversion that are different than maybe loss in general is, and you mentioned it already, that you you lose a sense of control over the chaotic world, right? Mm-hmm. Before when something bad happened, you could do something, you could pray. You have a sense of, I do this action and things get better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that is gone. And you and I have already discussed the first very difficult thing that happens in your life after that is very hard. I think another thing that's really unique is a bit of shame or guilt for having been fooled. How could I have believed this? How could I have been convinced by what to me now feel like really bad arguments, really bad (laughs) explanations and kind of letting go of that, let it, you know, forgiving yourself a bit. And then the, the last one is a tough one. And I don't know that I have an answer for this one. And, and that is that loss of community. And, yeah, you know, you had this built in community of people who imperfectly, sometimes badly, sometimes even, even destructively, uh, but they did care for you. You did have a sense of, I belong here. And, and losing that is, is devastating on top of losing what feels like the most intimate relationship you've ever experienced. Yes. And the realization that it was never there. I mean, there was no one there that you were having this relationship. Right. This relationship was with myself. It was with myself. It was with myself. Yeah. Yeah. The community thing is so tough. It's so tough. And right now, because of COVID, I think everybody's experiencing that. The loss of community. Yeah. I'm really grateful that I have some fabulous um, supports in my therapy community, just fellow therapists that I can talk to about these things. And some friends who have also deconverted, but man, it's, it's not the same, right? 
It's just not the same. Yeah. Actually, you bring up an interesting point mm-hmm. that I've been discussing lately, and that is uh, you mentioned when you first had your first son mm-hmm. that that natural break of I don't have to go to church mm-hmm. gives you the space. You can start to think you're not having all that reinforcement. You're not having the pressure of mental conformity. <laughs> yeah, I'm very curious to see and I'll, and the results of 2020, right? In the next few years, are we going to see even more people yes. uh, because they haven't been physically in the building yeah. having that reinforcement week after week after week? Yes. I'll be really interested to see how that impacts people's uh, spiritual lives. That is such an interesting thought. I haven't had that thought. Yes, I think that's probably true. You know what I do want to briefly talk about is, so a lot of the story arcs of your guests, and I've listened to a lot of your interviews, they're wonderful. It feels like there's some like sense of like, and here I am now, and I have it sort of like sorted out. And I just want to say I'm not there at all. Mm, Okay. Like our families know that we don't go to church and that we don't pray and that we don't talk about God to our kids and stuff, but Right. I've never had an explicit conversation because they don't want to. Yeah. I've offered it before. We said, you know, they'll say things like, well, we don't really know where you're at. And we've said, we're willing to talk to you if you want to. And then yes. they walk away. Deafening silence. Yes. Yes. <laughs> There's this feeling of like, well, do I just need to like write a letter so that they know so that it's out there? And my husband and I very much disagree about how to deal with this. I'm currently in therapy because of this. It's Mm -hmm. really, really hard. You know, it's really hard. He, and there's no right or wrong, but he so values their relationship over anything that he's like, let's just be quiet and go along and everything's okay. And I'm over here like, "Uh, but I value honesty. Mm. over the relationship. If I can't be honest in a relationship, then it's not worth my time. That's sort of how I feel, you know? Yeah. Or then it's, I shouldn't say that it's not worth my time. Then it's not. mm. It's less valuable. The relationship isn't as real. It's less valuable. And I get a lot of anxiety. It brings me back to that place of sitting in the pew and feeling like something's not right. Mm. And, and feeling a disconnect. And I don't believe this, but I do believe it. And it, it's that same feeling like, well, you know, being in a relationship where I can't be honest. I, I so value honesty, you know? Yeah. So that's hard. I just want to say to everyone who struggles with that, that's really hard. And I'm so grateful that my husband and I believe the same things as far as, you know, religion, but we don't agree with how then, how shall we then live, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Man, that is such a good point, and thank you mm-hmm. for bringing that up. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I want to just explicitly say, you know, I'm I'm winging it. It's day to day, right? Like uh, I don't I ever want it to come across like I've got this figured out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I can express things that are helpful for me or or things that I identify with now, but uh, it, it's definitely and really, honestly, adulting in general, we're all just winging it. <laughs> we're all just. Freaking, I know. I told I told my therapist today. I was like. In this area of my life, in the deconversion area of my life, I feel like I'm in my 30s, but I feel like a teenager. Because mm. it's, it's like a new adolescence is what it feels like to me. In many, many ways, right. it's awkward. I don't have answers. I'm trying to find myself. Who am I? It's, it feels very much like adolescence all over again. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Rachel, this has been an amazing conversation. I want to give you an opportunity to uh, let people know how they can get in touch with you, how they can find the poetry yes. uh, project that you have. Yes. Okay. So on Instagram, our handle is at small words underscore big stories. And my website is rcpstherapy.com. Excellent. Rachel, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Final thoughts on the episode. Well, as you can hear, Rachel is incredibly insightful and self-reflective. And given her expertise in psychology, I think that is always a fascinating conversation to hear someone describe the process of discovering 
cognitive dissonance in themselves with the terminology of psychology. I greatly appreciated Rachel's vulnerability, talking about a miscarriage, talking about growing up in a purity culture and the shame and guilt, sharing about breaking down, just stepping foot in a church and not yet knowing the term religious trauma or what that was. I think our discussion about the experience on this side of deconversion and also experiencing painful life events and how we used to have a sense of control or used to have a sense of protection that is no longer there. The placebo effect is gone and how difficult that is. The first very difficult thing that happens after your loss of faith is very, very hard. Obviously, I think we both agree that Secular therapy is very important, and I'd encourage you to reach out to either Rachel or to the Secular Therapy Project to find someone who you can talk to if you are going through just such a time. I want to plug here her practice at rcpstherapy.com. Of course, we'll have links in the show notes. There you can also find out more about her Small Words, Big Stories poetry and how you can submit your story there. I want to thank Rachel for being so honest and vulnerable and telling her story with such great passion. I am sure you're sick of hearing me talk about this, but I continue to have just these amazing conversations both in email and on digital hangouts of one sort or another, some of which don't make it as podcasts, whether the person needs to tell their story in a safe and non-public way or some of those conversations are in preparation for a potential future podcast episode. And I've had a couple of those recently that have just been incredibly meaningful. And it reminds me how important it is for us to tell our stories, how cathartic it is just to express the experience of questioning, of doubt, of landing where you land. So I want to just throw out again that if you are interested in telling your story, whether you want that to be a podcast episode or not, do reach out to me at gracefulatheist at gmail.com. You can look forward to some of those conversations as podcasts in the near future. And until then, my name is David, and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. Join me and be graceful human beings. Time for the footnotes. The beat is called Waves from Mackay Beats. Links will be in the show notes. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can promote it on your social media. You can subscribe to it in your favorite podcast application. And you can rate and review it on podchaser.com. You can also support the podcast by clicking on the affiliate links for books on gracefulatheist.com. If you have podcast production experience and you would like to participate with the podcast, please get in touch with me. Have you gone through a faith transition and do you need to tell your story? Reach out. If you are a creator or work in the deconstruction, deconversion, or secular humanism spaces and would like to be on the podcast, just ask. If you'd like to financially support the podcast, there's links in the show notes. To find me, you can Google Graceful Atheist You can Google deconversion. You can Google secular grace. You can send me an email, gracefulatheist at gmail.com. Or you can check out the website, gracefulatheist.com. My name is David, and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. Join me and be graceful human beings. This has been the Graceful Atheist Podcast.